thank you everybody for joining. Uh, the goal for this is really um, for devs and EMs to discover what they're looking for. You know, the, if you, when you're evaluating, you need to know what, not just the solutions you're evaluating, but why you're evaluating them. What is what does it mean for you? Um, and so, every every team, every product, every dev process is it's different. Um, this is a framework that's fairly high level, and the work we've put into it. Um, is a lot, but when you see it, it looks pretty simple. Um, the real work is when you start digging in um, to make this framework work for you. Um, you punch in your inputs to make better and more informed decisions about this evaluation that you're doing. Um, again, as Eric said, um, please use the chat room, the group chat. Um, you can send the message to everyone or you can send it directly to Eric. Um, we'll be writing these things down and then there'll be some questions uh, time for questions at the end. Uh, this is a short webinar, so I'm not going to go deep into the topic, um, but you can always message hello at touchlab.co and we'll get back to you. We'll, we, if you want to dive deeper, if you want us to help you out with your evaluation, we're here for you. So first of all, uh, there's a mix of people here. Uh, we had a lot of people sign up. We're still seeing people trickle in. Um, when, when you registered, we asked if you're currently sharing code, and these are the results. Uh, so this presentation is tailored to support every one of you. Um, if you're already sharing code, one part may be a bit boring for you. Um, if you're not, a different part, everything might be very interesting, um, but there's going to be something in here for everybody. I started at Touch Lab in 2016. Um, and that was a very interesting year to start. Um, at the time, I was helping us port our iOS or port client iOS apps to Android. We were connecting devices to internets of things that was starting to get bigger. Um, we, we helped New York City to make a smarter city with the Link NYC towers. You should look those up. They're awesome. Um, and even more importantly for the world, change the way NBA players ordered their pizza. Um, so we had a lot going on in 2016. It was also the year that we started evaluating multi-platform solutions. The reason we started looking into it is because Apple had built Research Kit to change the way medical research could be done. However, Research Kit was iOS only. Uh, Touch Lab was asked to build Research Stack to help researchers adopt their iOS apps to Android. So for something that was this important and world changing, why did it only come out for one platform? I mean, the, the easy answer is it because it was Apple and Apple just cares about iOS. But this really could have come out for both platforms at the same time to reach as many people and improve their lives as possible. Um, and we were thinking to ourselves, why are we spending time duplicating all the work that Apple did for Android? There, there has to be a better way to do this. Um, so we started looking into different solutions. We tried RoboVM, which compiled Java for use on iOS. Um, that would streamline our client work. Um, we liked it, then Xamarin bought it, then Microsoft bought Xamarin, and then they killed RoboVM. So that started us thinking of what's the lifetime factor of the, this solution? Um, for something else, we tried React Native. When we were using that, we found we didn't like JavaScript. And we were also worried about Facebook killing it. Um, at the time, we also didn't think it was mature enough for our clients. So our clients are something important to us. If you don't have clients, your business is important to you. Your users are important to you. I'll get into styling your rubric a bit later. Um, Google also asked us to try Flutter. Um, we weren't so keen on Dart. And once again, we didn't know how serious Google was about it. We weren't comfortable trying this out. We didn't know how long it was going to last. We didn't know how good it would be for client work. Um, so what we did is we ended up building Doppel around Google's J2 OBJC. We were comfortable with Java. The J in J2 OBJC is for Java. It translates that to Objective-C. Um, Google was using it in Gmail and a bunch of other G Suite apps, so we were confident in them. So that lifetime factor, the language factor was there, um, and then 
the client factor was there. We, we knew this could work for our clients. What we didn't know is that a few months later, Google would officially endorse Kotlin for Android development in 2017. Uh, and then nobody cared about Java anymore. Kotlin was how you were going to build Android apps. And we didn't want to have a solution that forced people to stay in the Java world. Um, so, so this language lifetime and client, that's sort of the beginnings of a rubric, of rubric a way to score these solutions for our purposes. And again, it's our purposes. Your purposes are going to be different. Fast forward to last year. Um, many companies were sunsetting and adopting mobile technology. Dropbox decided to no longer use C++ for code sharing. Udacity and Airbnb sunset React Native. Shopify decided to go all in on React Native. New Bank began ad adopting Flutter and Square began adopting Kotlin multi-platform. What they all had in common is that they knew that uh, they knew what they were doing when they were making this decision. It wasn't about the hype of, around the platform. It wasn't a top-down decree. They weren't rushing this. Uh, what they did was they compared solutions, they understood their reasons for looking into it, and then they scored it for their purposes. So how do you define your rubric? How do you get started? Um, you should start at a high level. Think about what your developers care about. Think about what your users care about um, and think about how important it is with integrating to the underlying iOS and Android platforms. You know, and, and then all of this is going to be informed by business strategy. What's your tolerance for risk? What's your, how much are you willing to invest? And what capabilities do you need over the next five years? Platform citizenship is a it's harder to explain. We always hear about developer experience and user experience. Um, what it really boils down to is whether the cross-platform solution becomes a third platform that you need to understand and maintain, um, or it becomes the only platform that you need to understand and maintain. Um, so while you, while you use this um, new platform, do you still have a way to get at the innate platform differences, the different APIs, the different uh, conventions that iOS and Android have. Um, if you care less about that, then that's part of your rubric. Um, if you care a lot about that, then that becomes part of your rubric. Um, so the, the way to think about this, the more the solution is its own platform, the more difficult it is to keep up with changes in the underlying platform. Uh, once you have an understanding of the high-level concerns, you can start diving deeper. Um, how is this solution, how does this solution actually work? How is it built? How does it integrate with my build system? Um, what language does it use? Does the VM reduce, reduce performance or does it increase the size of the app too much? Can we embed it with our existing apps? You know, this kind of stuff is really constrained by the technology. So depending on what you choose, you may, it may be impossible to do certain things. For example, uh, for, with Xamarin, it's impossible to integrate it with, with other apps um, unless you have a Xamarin app, which can then integrate with other libraries. Uh, but you're forced into, uh, into Xamarin world. Another thing to think about from the lower level is how the UI is shared. Um, this concern I learned, I knew about intuitively when we, were, when we were evaluating a lot of things, but Christina Lee over at Pinterest really boiled it down perfectly. Each solution either wraps up native UI, which is what React Native does, or it re-implements UI, which is what Flutter does, or it abstains, which is what Colin Native does. Colin native says, or call it multi-platform, says we're just going to focus on business logic. You do your UIs natively on both platforms. So now to, to bring this together, let's look at examples from the field. Um, all those folks that were pivoting their mobile stack in 2019, um, we can learn from them and, and see how they fit into this, this kind of framework. Uh, 
Newbank had a set of 11 criteria, and these were their top three. They focused heavily on developer experience and business strategy. Um, they are betting that Google is going to continue to support Flutter. And they explicitly liked that Flutter is very much a third platform. Not everyone's going to have the same rubric as them. Uh, that's what we see exactly from Shopify. They had a lot of emphasis on the language side of the developer experience. And they have a, a very strong business strategy around the future of web. Um, React Native allows them to continue to invest in web technology and bring web into mobile. Um, and they knew about the issues that Airbnb and Udacity brought up. They knew that they were going to have to invest in this and they made that business decision. They're investing in tooling, they're investing in foundational work, they've built teams around it to make it work for them. In 2013, uh, Dropbox decided to use C++ for code sharing. They they had a criteria they really cared about native UIs with shared logic. Over time, they saw the pain points of that and they reevaluated their criteria. Um, in 2019, they still wanted native UI. What they decided to do was forego the code sharing and refocus on platform citizenship and business strategy around development teams. Uh, Square was also focused on platform citizenship and developer experience. Now, they chose Kotlin multi-platform for code sharing because Kotlin is already first class on Android. Uh, they get to keep the option to use it where it makes sense, but they're under no obligation to use it where it doesn't make sense. So what they can do is they can incrementally adapt, adapt it in, instead of making a big decision up front. Uh, they're working with with us, with Touch Lab, to ensure that Kotlin multi-platform continues to provide value as they increase their adoption of it. So these folks were, were pivoting their stacks. Uh, Touch Lab had to pivot our stack because of Kotlin becoming mainstream and Java becoming what everybody doesn't want to use. Um, our announcement for pivoting was in tandem with Square's announcement. Um, and we're continuing so to support them. Here's our criteria summed up in this slide that, that Kevin Galligan has put together. He puts this in many of the things he talks about. Um, we care that it's optional, same as what Square cares about. We care that it integrates natively to both platforms. We care that it's open source. We care that it leverages Kotlin. Um, and we care that it focuses on non-UI logic. So this ticks a lot of the boxes that we care about. Um, that's why we chose this. To, um, I, I had a, a blog post that sort of exploded this out and tried to compare it to a few different other solutions. Um, and you can really see how once you, you have that high level understanding um, and you're able to break that down and compare solutions with your criteria, you can start grading them. And that's the real power of the rubric, is being able to put numbers to it and say, yeah, we, we like this solution. We're, we're biased towards this solution. But when we, we put it under an objective criteria, we see that another one wins out. Um, and when you, when you read the blog posts of, of New Bank and Shopify, you see that this is kind of the process that they went with. And they're confident in their decision. Along with Square and, and us, uh, there were a bunch of other companies at, over at uh, Kotlin Conf 2019. They announced that they were also going with Kotlin multi-platform. Um, so if you do choose this, you're in good hands. Um, and we are definitely happy to support engineers um, and these from these companies and from others um, through our Hack Weeks, through Camp Kit, through our refactory products and just talking to you about how you want to evaluate solutions. What's, what's good for your engineers? What's good for your business? Um, so once again, each, each company's different. You all have, you're all gonna come up with a different rubric. 
But what you can do is start from a high level. Think about your developers, think about your users, think about the platforms, think about your business. Uh, and then you can go down under the hood, learn more about how these, each of the solutions meets your criteria or doesn't meet your criteria. Um, and then, uh, what was it? Yeah, and then you'll be able to start putting it together. That's, that's where the hard work is, is coming up with that criteria, introspecting on yourself, learning about the, the, the framework or the, the solutions and how that fits what, you, what your needs are. Um, so I hope this, this helps you bootstrap or improve your evaluation of the multi-platform solutions and we'll leave the rest of the time for questions. I'm going to take a look at the chat. Yeah, we've got um, we've got one question right now. Um, Kevin, um, Justin, do you see it? Uh, yes. So I needed to pull up that on top of my other screen, but I got it. Okay. Uh, for yeah, so Kevin Moore asks for UI development. Don't you have to create separate UIs for each platform? Isn't that more work than Flutter or React Native? Um, Yes, it is more work than doing it once. Um, and you have to weigh that cost with the benefits that you're going to get from it. So if you, if you want to make use of the innovations that are happening on Android and iOS, so Apple and Google invest a lot of money into how their UIs are built. Um, Jetpack Compose is something that people are interested on the Android side right now. Swift UI is getting is maturing very quickly on the iOS side. Um, you need to think about your users of this. Are you going to create a UI that meets the expectations of your users better using the platform UI tooling um, and APIs? Or are you going to make a better solution using something like Flutter where everything's either custom or you're using widgets that may be lagging behind the platform innovations. Um, you also need to think about your developers. Um, we've talked to a lot of companies, their developers are super interested in Swift UI. They're super interested in Jet Jetpack Compose. Um, they are not going to want to use Flutter as a, for, as a career building uh, tool. They, they want to build their career around Android or iOS. So if their company switched over to Flutter, they're going to lose those people. So that's part of a business strategy. Um, are you okay with the churn you're going to get when you switch languages, when you switch tooling? Um, are people going to want to um, leave to go to another company? Uh, what kind of training is there that you need to put into this? Um, they're going to need to learn this new platform. Um, so that's where, where Newbank said, we are going to train our people on this. We do want to make sure that our UIs on both platforms look exactly the same. And when we don't, we're okay with the difficulty in, in branching an all-in-one solution off to, to support one and support the other. 